A portion of today's episode is brought to you by the Google Pixel 3. Hello, Internet, and this is Film Theory, the show where we always expose the so-called heroes for the psychopaths that they really are. Today, we're talking about Captain Marvel. Can she be trusted? No. No, she cannot. Therefore, we must band together and break down... What's going on here? Ah, uh, look, it's a scrawl imposter of me. Me, yes, the, the, the real MatPat. No, I'm uh, pretty sure that I'm the real MatPat. I think the viewers are smart enough to tell the difference, right? You very clearly understand that this is me. You can tell based on that buttery smooth voice. This other guy's voice is all kind of obnoxious. It sounds like a Green Goblin ripoff. Look at him over there with that smug grin. You know that this is the real MatPat because of this voice. My voice is annoying to a large majority of the internet, and you can tell that because my voice is quite annoying right now. I mean, look, it's me. I, I'm, I'm even holding a Diet Coke. It looks like he's drinking a Mountain Dew or something. I don't know. I don't I don't drink a Mountain Dew. At the very least, it would be a Diet Mountain Dew. A diet sodas are just what I prefer. My stomach doesn't really adjust all that well to fully sugared sodas. It's just a fact of the matter. You know that he's the imposter. Does he even wear his hair that way? No. No, he does not. Probably not. I listen to these episodes more as podcasts, really. But I'm not some evil doppelganger. How dare you suggest that? He even said, hello, internet, and this this is filmed. That's not the phrase. He doesn't even know the phrase. How how could you possibly go with this guy? That is not what I say every episode. Oh, come on. Hello, Internet. Welcome to Film Theory. The real film theory, except no substitutes. And how do I know you're not a scroll? Now you're getting it. As we prepare for the upcoming release of Captain Marvel, I've become obsessed less with her as a character and more with her foes, the shape-shifting Skrulls. As the trailers have shown, anyone, even a kindly old grandma on the metro, can turn out to be a highly trained, deadly Skrull warrior. Well, there's your first clue, Captain Marvel. This is on the Los Angeles subway. No normal human being rides that thing. That's not a statement about the people who ride it, it's more about LA's lackluster public transportation system. Anyway, if you think Kevin Feige and the team over at Marvel is gonna be content with revealing one random little old woman as a scrawl, then I don't think you've been paying attention. Captain America's best friend killed Iron Man's mom, Loki has been written off as dead multiple times, and oh yeah, the entire good guy team of S.H.I.E.L.D. turned out to be controlled by their arch nemesis Hydra. Twist reveals are as integral to this franchise as shots of topless men. So with Captain Marvel being the only movie left before we head into the end game and the next phase of the MCU, I think we can all expect one or two last big gut punch reveals that some familiar face we've been seeing over the last 10 years might just be an alien in disguise. So today, it is my goal to predict where the secret scrolls are hiding in the MCU while also exonerating any of the key suspects. Can we see the twists coming before it hits theaters? Probably not, based on my track record, but that doesn't mean I'm not gonna try. Using evidence, logic, and solid narrative structure, gosh darn it. Oh, and uh, in case it wasn't obvious yet, spoilers for all the MCU movies up through Ant-Man and the Wasp. Before we start, let's all review our scroll basics to ensure that we're working with the same set of knowledge. Because the scrolls haven't made an official MCU appearance yet, even if they have been there the whole time in hiding, it means that we're not 100% sure what features of these characters will be used from the original source material. But it is still probably the best place to start. The scrolls were an ancient race of green skin humanoids with pointy ears, who were initially peaceful when they interacted with other civilizations. Due to their genetic instability, they are blessed with the ability to shapeshift, making it easy for them to facilitate trade and conduct diplomacy. As a result, their civilization grew and prospered. Well, at least until they met the Kree. You're a Kree, a race of noble warriors? Heroes. Uh, y you sure about that, Captain Marvel? It must depend on who you ask, since our only exposure to the Kree up to this point has been Guardians of the Galaxy galaxy, in which old purple-eyed blue dragon Ronan the Accuser over here was of the Kree race, which should give you some example of their disposition. I will unfurl 1,000 years of Kree justice on Xandar, and burn it to its core! Someone's an angry boy. You call me boy! The Skrulls and Kree go to war for hundreds of thousands of years, changing the Skrulls into a warrior race. And from there on out, it's basically never a good thing when either the Kree or the Skrulls show up on Earth. As I've mentioned, the Skrulls' main ability is shape-shifting, and usually it's just limited to that, shape. 
able to copy practically anything. Organic, like a cow, or inorganic, like a lamb. Able to copy inorganic things? Maybe the time stone was actually a scroll in disguise. <laughs> That's just dumb. But that's not all. They also have the ability to copy memories, making them even harder to spot. The scroll had her appearance, her voice, yes. But it also had her memories. She was a perfect copy in every way. Once you reveal a scroll, the fight's just beginning. While they're no problem for heavy hitters like Thor or the Hulk, scrolls do have some serious superhuman strength and a healing factor that's far beyond that of a normal person. There's also a special species of so-called super scrolls that can even absorb superpowers. In the cancelled MCU tie-in video game The Avengers, there were even super scrolls that seemed to have absorbed the powers of Hulk, Captain America, Iron Man, and Thor all at the same time. So that pretty much makes everyone in the MCU you a suspect. No superpowered rage monster or sorcerer supreme is fully safe from suspicion, but we can do some logical deduction to reduce our list of suspects. As bold of a move as it would be, I think it's pretty safe to say that Tony Stark, the de facto main character of the MCU up to this point, is safe from being a Skrull. If he was one, it would be coming out of nowhere, and it would vastly cheapen our entire experience so far with this universe. A twist for twist's sake just wouldn't be worth undercutting a decade's worth of emotional investment into this guy. The same can be said of Captain America, who's already dealt with multiple imposter situations in these movies. Between the Hydra reveal and the Bucky as a killer reveal, betrayal is just part of his everyday life. So for him to pull off the proverbial Scooby-Doo mask to reveal himself as someone different would just be unmotivated bad storytelling. Next, we can reasonably eliminate the victims from the snappening in Infinity War. Oh, sorry, according to the novelized tie-ins, it's now called The Decimation. Lame. I like riffing on terrible horror movie names where the trees are out to kill humanity. What? No. Hashtag snappening was happening. Well, regardless, if they're going to all the trouble to remove someone from these movies just to bring them back, they're probably not gonna be a scroll. Reveals stacked on reveals just feel kinda cheap from a storytelling standpoint. Or if they did come back, they'd come back in scroll form, in which case, you got some splang, do -do. also included in the group killed in Infinity War would be Loki, who, you know, definitely isn't dead yet. But being a scroll would just be too many things that Loki is on top of not being being dead twice. Clint Barton, who you may know as Hawkeye, seems to be making a return in the persona of Ronin in Endgame, avenging his snapped away family based on them saying you lost family right before showing him in his new outfit. It's not impossible that he's a scroll, but it would greatly cheapen his dark vengeance arc. Also safe from a storytelling perspective is Black Widow, who is about to get her own movie. Going into a solo movie as a recently outed alien imposter is gonna really strain fan acceptance of that new IP, so it certainly seems like she's to be safe. And lastly, her beau, Hulk, who was certainly acting strange in Infinity War. In the past, Bruce could never remember things that happened when he was the Hulk. Who's that? Well, he kind of runs the place. You actually lived in his house for a while. I did? Yeah, quite a lot's happened. You and I had a fight recently. Did I win? No, I won. Easily. And yet, in Infinity War, he remembers both Thanos and the Infinity Stones as Banner. Thanos is coming. He's coming. He's also the perfect candidate for a scroll takeover, a generally confused professor type who, after Age of Ultron, goes missing for years, meaning there was plenty of opportunity for the old switcheroo, with above average knowledge of the universe and a best friends list that includes a bunch of superheroes. But I gotta take him off the list too, since Hulk, as a separate entity inside Banner, would certainly reject the imposter, and not in the way that we see in the movie. Come out! Come out! Come out! No! But even with that big chunk of candidates out of the way, we're still left with a number of juicy options. First, Thor the juiciest of the bunch. Thor just went through a massive character change, going from dark and brooding and thoughtful at the end of Age of Ultron to a big old goofball in Ragnarok. Sure, that was a course correct for a character who is struggling to resonate with audiences, but still, that change could be explained through a scroll takeover. You know what else could be explained through scroll control? His ineptitude when it comes to finding Infinity Stones. At the beginning of Thor Ragnarok, he outright says this. And I went searching through the cosmos for some magic colorful Infinity Stone things. Things. Didn't find any. Oh, you didn't, did ya? That's odd considering at the end of Thor The Dark World, even this Asgard grunt knows the location of two. But if I may ask, why not keep it secure in your own vault? The Tesseract is already on Asgard. It is not wise to keep two Infinity Stones so close together. Seems like not even Taika Waititi, director of Ragnarok, was able to get through the entirety of Thor Dark World. And lastly, let's be honest here, it's a bit weird that the God of Thunder is repeatedly taken
taken out by an electrical collar shock. Suspicious, right? That said, I'm gonna have to knock him off the list for two reasons. First, his actor Chris Hemsworth has hinted that there's more Thor to come, so doing a drastic character upheaval like a scroll reveal would risk reverting a character back to a more boring version of himself when he'd finally found the popularity he was looking for with audiences. And secondly, from a lore standpoint, until the hammer breaks in Ragnarok, Thor carries it around with no problem. Lifting Mjolnir isn't a matter of strength or super abilities, but worthiness. A scroll pretending to be Thor wouldn't be seen as worthy by the hammer, and thus shouldn't be able to lift it. Therefore, Thor is safe. So, who's left? Who are the secret scrolls, or are we just looking for reveals that'll never happen? I don't think so. The first candidate I, and a bunch of other online theorists, feel really confident about is General Thaddeus Thunderbolt Ross. Who? I hear you asking. Well, Ross made his debut in the second MCU movie ever released, the oft-forgotten Incredible Hulk, where he did what General Ross always does in Hulk stories. He helps create the Hulk, then he fights against the Hulk, then he lets the Hulk go before hunting him down yet again. He creates the Hulk in his obsession with Captain America's super soldier serum. Then, he uses Hulk to fight against Abomination. But come Captain America Civil War, Ross is singing a totally different tune. The General has quit the army and has now risen to the role of Secretary of State. But what really stands out here isn't the change in role, it's his change as it regards enhanced humans. He's a strong advocate for the Sokovia Accords, which puts restrictions on superhero activity, practically the opposite of his views in Incredible Hulk. He explains this change of viewpoint by telling a story. After 13 hours of surgery and a triple bypass, I found something. Perspective. It's one of those oddly specific moments in a movie that's either lampshading the clear retcon of his character, or it's setting up some oddly specific details that'll pay off once the change in perspective is revealed to be a scroll takeover. Anyway, he is now the driving force that's trying to restrict the actions of heroes. He's the one responsible for a bill that drives a wedge between the team, thereby weakening the Avengers and scattering them across the globe, making Earth vulnerable to scroll attack. He has a high rank, not just in the military, but also in the government at a national and international scale. And his reintroduction in Civil War and shoehorning into Infinity War after eight years of silence in the MCU is suspicious without measure, especially since his involvement in the former movie was initially teased as being, quote, a new General Ross. And you don't have to take my word for it, from the mouth of the actor himself, quote, what they've done is they've taken a character who was the Ross from the older film and made a new version. This is a much newer Ross, a much different Ross, end quote. We're on to you, new General Ross. You're not gonna surprise anyone when you reveal yourself as the little green man you are on the inside. So General Ross, in my opinion, is almost certainly a scroll. But that reveal isn't gonna be all that impactful on anyone. Is anyone really watching at home clutching their General Ross action figures close to their chests, being like, I can't wait to see more from this guy? No, I would assume not. But there is still one very interesting option whose impact might have a little more oomph. Rhodey, aka War Machine. James Rhodey Rhodes is Tony Stark's best friend, and as one of Iron Man's closest and oldest advisors, he'd already be a fantastic target for any intelligence organization. But Rhodey is a double whammy because he's also a high-ranking Air Force officer with the ability to call off strikes on hostile aircraft. That's a pretty handy ability should the Skrull be looking to attack. And that's before he even start considering his possession and mastery of a heavily armed mech suit. He also disappears with the Iron Man Mark II armor for a suspiciously long amount of time in Iron Man 2 before he takes it to his superiors in the military. We know that Tony lives in Malibu, California, and we are expressly told by the movie that Rhodey flies it to Edwards Air Force Base, which is close enough that you could drive between the two locations in a matter of hours. And yet here it is, night to day. Where were you that whole time, Rhodey? Maybe giving that suit to your scroll friends for an inspection? From a narrative standpoint, Rhodey is one of the best possible choices. He's an important enough character that he's a familiar heroic face, but he's not so important that him having a secret identity would undermine a lot of the emotional stakes that we have in the more well-established characters. Plus, the reveal of Rhodey as a Skrull would be the final blow to Tony, who's already undergone so many changes throughout these other movies. He's changed his motivations, his morals, he's lost that arrogance and swagger 
there with it being replaced by paranoia, he's connected with a sun surrogate that he then loses, and he's been forced to question almost every belief that he had back in 2008 when this whole mess started. So for Rhodey to go and betray him, reveal that he had been body swapped somewhere before Iron Man 2 when Don Cheadle took over the role, then truly Tony would have to question the last thing he has left, his faith in even his closest of friends. But for actual evidence, we turn yet again to Captain America Civil War. He's one of the very few Avengers to actually sign the Sokovia Accords, helping to ensure the superheroes are restricted in their actions. He's also badly hurt during that movie's airport showdown when Vision misses Falcon's wings and instead hits Rhodey's power supply, causing him to plummet hundreds of feet. Seeing the scene the first time, I was shocked. And then I was shocked again that we were told that he was still alive and only just paralyzed. A fall like that would kill any human, especially a human in hundreds of pounds of armor. No question. But an alien that's slightly stronger than a human and has healing factor? Definitely a lot more believable. And speaking of that healing factor, Rhodey's recovery is equally alien. In just two years in movie time, he's strong enough to fight in the Battle of Wakanda. Honda? I don't buy it. Sure, Tony builds him artificial legs, but look at famous stuntman Evil Knievel, who fell from much lower heights and broke no less than 35 bones in his body. His recovery time was often years, with him self-reporting that he spent more than half the years between 1966 and 1973 in hospitals, in wheelchairs, on crutches. There is no way that Rhodey is back to fighting for him that quickly without some scroll levels of healing. So unless Rhodey's about to reveal that he's been hiding Wolverine in his basement, which I gotta admit would be a pretty hilarious way to explain where the X-Men have been this whole time. We may need to start considering that Tony Stark's best friend may not be who Tony thinks he is. But hey, that's just a theory. A film theory. And cut. Can we seriously talk for a minute about how excited I am for superhero movies at this point? Into the Spider-Verse was so good, one of the best animated movies I've seen in a long time. The Far From Home trailer has me very hyped to see my boy Mysterio on screen, and curious about where they're gonna take that story. Not from a literal standpoint, since obviously it's all about a trip through Europe. And Endgame is the climax of a decade of incredible superhero crossovers. And you know when he comes back from being dusted, Peter Parker is gonna be all about that epic superhero selfie now that he's an official Avenger. Kid, you're an Avenger now. Except there's one problem here. How do you cram all those capes and broad shoulders together into one epic selfie? There's just too many of them, especially when one is a giant green rage monster. Well, it would be a problem if it wasn't for the sponsor of this portion of today's episode, the Google Pixel 3. Quite literally, the superhero of phones. And nothing shows this off better than the phone's camera. Have too many super friends in your shot? Well, the Pixel 3 has dual front-facing cameras that enable super wide shots, turning the selfie into the groupie. No longer are you dependent on the guy with the elastic arm power to take the picture. Make sure that you're getting your whole self, or the superhero fight that's going on behind you, into the picture every time. And we all know that superheroes like to work at night, which leads to some terrible photo ops. Typically, the low light would produce something that looks like this, muddy and dark. But with Pixel 3's Night Sight, which uses a combination of algorithms and machine learning, the picture becomes this. Not a moment of copyright neutral crime fighting will be missed. Seriously, though, this mode is like magic. I used it a lot during the holidays. It was incredible. Eat your heart out, Sorcerer Supreme. And last, but certainly not least, there's Top Shot, where Google's machine learning can process the frames before and after the shutter was pressed to find the best image of you possible, ensuring that every picture gets smiles and not blinks, which is a great feature for family photos and slightly less relevant if your face is covered in an expressionless superhero mask to hide your secret identity all the time. So whether you're a teenager looking to grab some great shots during your international field trip, struggling to fit your whole superhero self into frame, or just looking to put some better selfies on the web, the world wide web that is, check out the Pixel 3, quite literally the superhero of phones. For more info, check out the link in the description. Now, if you'll excuse me, I need to go see Spider-Verse again. There are so many Easter eggs. Those are all theories for another day. Film theories and cut.